I'm honored to introduce our next set of keynote speakers. Please welcome Tabito and Laurent. Thank you so much, Thomas. As he says, I'm Tabitha Sable, and I'm really glad that uh, y'all have come here to join us because I want to share with you some stories about how EBPF has helped us to push through boundaries, both like within operations and also with product development to do things safer, faster, and more easily than what we could have with traditional techniques. So I'm, I'm hoping that these will be kind of interesting stories, but also that they can encourage you to do the same things, either to be able to take you know, normal open source software and run things at bigger and more interesting scales than you could have, or to extend your own products to have new and interesting features. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Laurent Bernay, and I'm also very happy to be, to be here today. So first of all, for those of you who don't know Datadog, we're a SaaS-based monitoring company, and we're building many products around observability. And both Tabitha and I work in the infrastructure team responsible for powering this SaaS product. And to give you an idea, we run tens of thousands of hosts and manage dozens of Kubernetes clusters, some of them pretty big. We also run on, on multiple cloud, which makes things even more challenging. So I'm, I'm going to talk about how we use EBPF in our infrastructure today. So to give you an idea, here is a very simplified diagram of our infrastructure. Um, and you can see that we run uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters on multiple cloud providers. And this comes with quite a few challenges. So the first one is, since we run multiple clusters, we need to make sure that we can address communications between clusters. So an app in cluster A can talk to an app in cluster B. But also, we need to be able to, see, to make this communication secure, of course. In order to do that, we decided from the get-go, so about more than two years ago, that every single pod in our environment would have writable IP from the underlying network. This comes with several advantages, uh, better performance, and also enables us to do uh, direct close cluster communication, which means an application in cluster A can directly contact an IP from a pod in cluster B, which is often required for data stores such as Kafka or Cassandra, or for GPC communications where you want to do client side load balancing and the client need to be aware of all the backends. So these are the good things. Uh, it also comes with a few challenges. Uh, the first one is managing the IP space because of course, if, if every single pod in a large infrastructure as a unique writable IP, it means you need to be very careful in terms of choosing the network ranges you're using. And of course, if uh, having writable IPs is helpful because application in cluster A can talk to application in cluster B, then you need to solve cross-cluster service discovery, right? So the initial uh, solutions we, we used to do that was to look for CNI plugins allowing for it. Uh, on AWS, uh, we, we've been using the plugin by Lyft, which is doing exactly this, and it's been extremely helpful for us. And it was slightly easier on GCP because on GCP, you can alias IP ranges to network cards, which means you can grab IPs from these ranges for, for pods, and you just have to do very simple routing on, on, on the pods themselves. Of course, as we move to other cloud providers, we would have required to find new solutions for them. Uh, an additional challenge is, as I was mentioning before, we wanted security on the network side and this solution doesn't give it. And there was uh, no simple way to extend it to do encryption. If you run Kubernetes, you also know uh, that you have to do service load balancing. Um, and this is how it works in general. Uh, so you, the typical way to do that is to run kubeproxy on your nodes and kubeproxy will watch for endpoint information, uh, endpoint change in the cluster, and would configure a proxy which the client will use to send traffic to pods by using a virtual IP. The default implementation uh, is IP tables, and it works completely fine. So of course, IP tables is mostly well known uh, for filtering packets, 
but you can also use it to do some kind of load balancing and it, and it works. However, when you scale and you have a large number of services and endpoints, this becomes challenging. And updating the rules uh, can take seconds, like more than take seconds sometimes. And even on the data pass, going through all the rules to match the one that you're interested in can take some time. So of course, IP table comes with the kernel and it, we can use it for load balancing, but it was not designed for it. And luckily, the kernel um, also has a native load balancing solution, which is called IPVS. And at some point, people realized that using IPVS as a proxy or for QProxy was, was a good idea. And there was an implementation, and it's very, very powerful. And we've been using that from, from the start, too. So this sounds very promising, but we also faced quite a few challenges. The first one is if you're familiar with connection tracking issues, when you use IPVS, you have it two times, once for IPVS and one for NetFilter. And IPVS has made huge progresses, but it's still lacking uh, in terms of feature parity compared to IP tables. So we had to be uh, quite involved with the community to make it work for our environment, but we've been happy with it even if we're still facing a few issues. As a summary, uh, we were facing growing pains uh, around these problems, uh, mostly because IP tables was not designed to be a load balancer, and IPVS was designed to be a load balancer, but not designed to be a client-side load balancer for Kubernetes. And as Daniel was saying before, uh, you can always improve the kernel or fix issues when you find them, but getting these fixes into your real environment can take some time. And at the beginning of the presentation, I was mentioning network policies. And of course, we could have used IP table for that, but it would make the number of rules even larger and triggering even more problems. So this gets us to eBPF, right? Because the question is, how can we do programming? Uh, how can we programmatically, dynamically program these features in the kernel and extend the kernel to support Kubernetes better? And here is what we, what we do today and what we plan to do in the future. So the way we currently use eBPF to power Kubernetes networking is we rely on Cilium and we use it to replace QProxy and solve all the problems I was mentioning before. We also use it to enforce network policies because using eBPF to do filtering is much more efficient, again, as Daniel was explaining before. Uh, Cilium also brings universal CNI, which means we can use Cilium on multiple cloud, which has been very helpful for us. And you can also use, uh, use it for host to host encryption, which is very powerful. And since uh, we're now using eBPF to power the data plane, it means we can extend it in many ways and leverage new features from Kubernetes you know, very easily. And we have ideas of things we'd be very interested in, in doing in the future, such as using eBPF to redirect traffic to sidecars or to daemon sets, or to extend support to Envoy and Endpoint Discovery Service. So far, I've mostly mentioned uh, how we leverage eBPF inside our clusters. But as you can imagine, being a SaaS product, we get a lot of traffic to our, to our infrastructure. And one of the challenges is getting traffic efficiently inside the clusters and inside our environments. And we're really thinking that uh, we should probably uh, look into using eBPF to create a smarter and more efficient network edge to do filtering, DDoS mitigation, routing, and, and maybe more. So it's very new to us. It's something we're just starting to consider, but we'll probably invest uh, some time in, into this.